to John's Gospel. Thank you for this chapter. Thank you for this book. And as we consider a few verses tonight, Lord, may we be blessed and may we be challenged, especially in our area of witnessing to friends and family. For we pray this now. Well, Lord, we just thank you again for being with God. Thank you for being with the, the team of uh, medical personnel and the surgeons, oncologists. Um, and I just pray, Father, we know that he will be in excruciating pain right now. Please calm him down, Lord. Relieve him of the pain. And again, Father, we just ask you that your will, your perfect will, be done with regard to this cancer. We pray this now in your precious name. Amen. So we are still in John chapter 1. I'm going to try and finish the chapter tonight. Um, just a few verses and just focusing on one man especially. And his name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel, and I'm sure you all hopefully would know what Nathaniel said. It's a bit of a tagline that some, some of us know. So tonight we're talking about John, from John chapter 1 verse 43. And you know this whole passage from verse 19 on is dealing with four days in the life of the witness of John. And this is the historical narrative. And now we, we are going through the stages where Jesus is getting together his disciples and how they follow him. So Jesus is gathering his disciples. We know that John the witness or John the baptizer started it off. He led the first two to Jesus um, in verse 29. That's when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, or verse, 30, verse 35, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And then, of course, they started following Jesus and Jesus asked them, What seek ye? What do you want? And uh, Jesus said, well, then come and see. And they came and saw and they stayed. They abided. They remained with Jesus. And those first two were John, who is the author of this gospel, John the Apostle, and Andrew. Andrew. And immediately from verse 41, uh, we, we read uh, the last time that Andrew then goes to find his brother Peter. And Peter is brought to Jesus. He one thing Andrew is known in scripture is that he's always finding something, finding someone to bring to Jesus. And the whole order of this witness is you go out and you find someone and you say, we have found Jesus. And you say, come and see. And they come and see and they stay. And then the cycle is repeated. Go and find. And you tell that person, we have found. And you say, come and see. And you bring them to Jesus. And Tonight we're just talking a little bit about personal evangelism. And so today's passage from verse 43, I trust that you are reading ahead. We don't have much time, so I can't read each and every verse and go through each and every verse uh, uh, line by line as we do usually on a Sunday morning. But the gist of this is that, so now you have John, the apostle, Andrew and Peter. Now Jesus finds someone. Verse 43 says, the following day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find a Philip and saith unto him, follow me. And so here you find a different scenario where Jesus finds somebody himself personally. He calls Philip personally and Philip personally and immediately responds and starts following Jesus. Jesus just said those two words to him, follow me and Philip started to follow. And so the cycle starts again. Go and find you tell someone, we have found, come and see, bring them to Jesus and let them stay with Jesus, abiding, following, remaining. Now look at the scenario in verse 45. Philip, so Jesus sees Philip and Jesus says, follow me. Philip immediately, Philip says, the Bible says in verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law. And the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so we see here, Philip wastes no time. They immediately, no time wasting, he goes out to find his friend. He finds his friend Philip and he says, We have found him of whom Moses wrote and whom the prophets wrote all about uh, in the Old Testament. And his name is Jesus. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So you can immediately see the excitement in his voice. You can feel the passion that Philip has for a lost soul like his friend Nathaniel. He has found Jesus. Philip has found Jesus. And Philip sees the need to find his friend. and Says to him, Nathaniel, 
We have found Jesus. So you see, Philip was just found Jesus himself. He immediately goes to find his best friend Nathaniel and invites him to Jesus. And so what's going through Philip's mind is this, and I trust that we can identify with this. Philip is saying, I cannot find Jesus and keep Jesus to myself. I cannot find Jesus and not share this amazing event and this amazing discovery. I can't keep this from my friend. How can I keep this the most important day in my life? How can I keep that a secret? My question is, oh, my desire is, oh, that we as Christians would have that same burden for our unsaved friends and family. I can't help but think of those that we interact with every day, colleagues, your friends at school. You have Jesus in your heart. Why is it that we don't share that same passion and excitement and enthusiasm that Philip had to say, let me find somebody and bring them to Jesus? But interestingly, look how Nathaniel responds. Verse 46. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Aish. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? In other words, what, what Nathaniel is saying to his friend Philip, he's saying, listen, Philip, you're saying I must come to Jesus, but why are you excited? How can you be excited for someone who comes from Nazareth? If he's from Nazareth, then I'm not interested. Don't waste my time taking me to somebody from that part of the world. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And of course, unfortunately, we do the same thing. You know, you, you know I can take you out of that place where you came from, nuclear, that's across the highway there. We use that in a derogatory sense. Can anything good come out of that township or that location? And here, Nathaniel is saying the same thing. Can any good come out of Nazareth? And of course, the question is, is he being racist? Is he being pre prejudiced? Is he being a realist? Or an idealist? Remember, he's once, he's Messiah. He's looking for the deliverer of the Israelites. And now his friend Philip is saying he's from lowly, a uh, low place like uh, Nazareth. See, basically in Nathaniel's mind, there was just no way that the Messiah could come from an ungodly, wicked city like Nazareth. After all, I mean, wasn't Jesus born in Bethlehem? What's this now about Nazareth? Can you imagine poor Philip? So excited about him finding Jesus, he rushes over to his friend Nathaniel. Nathaniel, come, we have found the Messiah. Come, come, come. And Nathaniel turns around and bursts his bubble, as it were. Nathaniel says, don't waste my time. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And poor Philip, probably thinking, how can my friend insult my Savior? How can my friend inf insult Jesus like this? Out of everything I said, the only thing he heard were the three words, Jesus of Nazareth. What do you think Philip's going to do? How does he respond to Nathaniel in trying to convince him to follow Jesus or to come to Jesus? Does he defend Jesus? Does he argue with Nathaniel? Does he get into a fight? Does he hit with a slap back? You know, you said something nasty. I'm going to say something nasty. No, not Philip. Philip answers with three simple words. And the second time you see these words and all he says, Nathaniel, come and see. Nathaniel, come and see exactly what we saw in John chapter 1 verse 39. Tie in those two, those two verses. There's no retaliation from Philip, only an invitation. There is no argument, no fight. He doesn't start arguing and defending and fighting and raising his voice and, and, and ridiculing Nathaniel for, for saying that nasty sentence there, what good can come out of Nazareth? All he says, Nathaniel, come and see. Nathaniel, come and see for yourself. Nathaniel, come and see Jesus because Jesus is the answer whom, that you are looking for. He will take care of your doubts and your questions. Now, if I can just give you a quick tip for evangelism and for witnessing. If you are saved today and you are experiencing the same sort of scenario with somebody whom you are trying to lead to the Lord, remember this, never fight or argue with the unsaved. Rather be kind, rather be patient. Don't try and answer every question. Sometimes they will ask a, 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 a sincere question where they do not know the answer. Sometimes they may ask a question where they try and trick you and, uh, and, um, and force you into a corner and force you to admit that you don't know the answer. What you should try and do is get them to Jesus directly. 
as quickly as possible. You see, God is better at defending himself than we are at defending him. Let me tell you what William Barclay wrote. He says, not many people have ever been argued into heaven. Or he said Christianity. I'm just saying heaven. You are not going to argue someone into, into heaven or into Christianity. Often our arguments do more harm than good. The only way to convince a man of the supremacy of Christ, this is William Barclay speaking, is to confront him with Christ. And that's exactly what Peter does. He says, Nathaniel, come and see. And so he goes with Nathaniel. Important. He doesn't just send Nathaniel. He goes with Nathaniel and says, Come, Nathaniel, let's go to Jesus. He takes him to Jesus. And so the two of them go off to meet Jesus. And Jesus, think of this. Jesus sees them approaching. What does Jesus do? Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom no is no guile. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Simple terms, Jesus looks at Nathanael and says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit, in whom there is no guile or deceit. Let's break it down. First, Jesus identifies him as a Jew. Secondly, Jesus identifies him as a Jew in whom there is no deceit or no guile. In other words, he's saying an honest Jew. My dad used to tell us a lot of stories about how they used to get robbed in Beaufort West by the, the Jewish store owners. You buy clothes and they make it tight here so it looks like it fits tight. And, and when you get home, then it's five sizes too big for you. And here's Jesus saying, here is an, a good man. Here is an honest man. Here is a man of integrity, a man of moral character. What you see is what you get. And this is what Jesus is saying as he looks at Nathaniel. But remember what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that you are or he is sinless. Jesus is not saying that this man is perfect. All he's saying is, and listen carefully, Jesus is saying as he looks at Nathaniel approaching, Jesus says, here is a good man, but a good man who still needs a savior. A good man who needs Jesus. And for us, remember, all the good deeds in the world, doesn't matter whether you are the nicest, most honest, kindest person. All that cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. You see, Nathaniel was a re religious man. He was a good man. A man who truly had a desire to know God. Who, was, who wanted to meet Jesus. But Nathaniel was also a lost man because he did not have Christ in his life. You see, even the nicest of people are lost people. Even the most honest and genuine of people are still lost. Religious people, you may be the most religious person on the planet. Religious people are still lost people. Because even religious people, honest people and good people still need a personal encounter with Jesus. Picture the scene again. There's Andrew, uh, Philip and Nathaniel coming to Jesus. Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. You can imagine a statement like this from Jesus must have shocked Nathaniel. I think it caught him off guard. And look how he responds when Jesus says that in, in the second part of verse 48. When, when he says, he says, Whence knowest thou me? In the middle there. Whence knowest thou me? He says to Jesus, How do you know me? How does Jesus know what I'm like? How does Jesus know the type of person I am? How could he possibly make such a statement about me without ever meeting me or even knowing me? You see, what Nathaniel didn't know was that he was dealing with Jesus, the Son of Man. He was dealing with Jesus, the Son of the Living God, the omniscient, all-knowing one. Now, if that statement shocked Nathaniel, I think the second one made him shiver, sent shivers down his spine. Look what Jesus says to, to Philip, to, to Nathaniel, sorry, the second part of verse 48. Sorry, the light is blinding my eye now, so I'm going to read from my, from my iPad here. This is what Jesus says to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So remember, Philip, Jesus met uh, uh, Andrew, uh, Philip. Jesus said, Philip, follow me. Philip followed Jesus, then Philip says, I need to go and fetch my friend Nathaniel. Nathaniel come, Nathaniel says, what good can come out of, Jesus, uh, out of, Nath uh, out of uh, Nazareth? They bring Nathaniel to Jesus. Jesus says, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. 
Nathaniel says, but where do you know me from? Jesus says, Nathaniel, before you even came there, before Philip even came to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Wow. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, even before Philip came to call you to come to me. Now, uh, some background here very quickly. What tree is the, is the symbol of Israel? Do you know? The tree that is the symbol of Israel? The, here's the answer. The fig tree. Now, the religious Jews in that day, and of course in Palestine, was very, very hot at certain times of the year. And due to the heat, they had a unique habit. They would find a big fig tree with lots of shade, find a secluded spot, and they would go and sit under the shade of the fig tree. And there they would study the Bible. They would read they would have their devotions, they would pray, they would meditate, they would sing. And of course, it's unlike the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus had to, had to reprimand the Pharisees because they were doing all that in, in, in public, in a place where everyone could see that. Here they did it privately. Nathaniel was one of those who would find a fig tree, sit under it, and meditate on Scripture. With no one around, no one to see them, no one would know. And here Jesus says, Nathaniel, I saw you. When you thought nobody could see you, when you thought nobody was looking, I saw you under the fig tree even before Philip came to fetch you. Beloved, that's only God. The omniscient God. Jesus, the same Jesus from Nazareth, is almighty God. And only as God could Jesus have seen Nathaniel while Nathaniel was under the fig tree thinking that he was all alone in a secluded private spot where nobody could see him. Only an omniscient God could do this. Only an omniscient God like Jesus could see, could know this. And especially to know that Nathaniel was there under the fig tree even before Philip called him. And of course Nathaniel is shocked. He's blown away. He knows now that Philip was absolutely right that this is Jesus whom he said he is. That this is Jesus of Nazareth. That this Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And so Nathaniel makes his own powerful confession in verse 49. And this is what he says. He says to Jesus, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And so, beloved, Nathaniel becomes a believer and a follower of Jesus. And that's how Nathaniel becomes a disciple. But does, does it end there? No, this is just the beginning. Look at verse 50. Jesus answers and said, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than this. In other words, Nathaniel, the best is yet to come. But this is the first day of your Christian walk with me. And now the work actually starts. Nathaniel, your work is starting. And you will see greater things than these. You see, your Christian walk, Jesus wants Nathaniel to know that con his confession of faith was only the beginning. You cannot get saved and just leave it there. You have to walk with Jesus and experience the greater things of your Christian life. Someone has said, finding Jesus isn't the end of your search. It is the beginning of your work. It is the beginning of our work. You know, the only thing that Jesus asks us to wait for is his coming. But we are to work until he comes. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying to Nathaniel. My question is tonight, I want to challenge you. Can we follow the disciples' example? And this is how they worked it. Immediately as they started to follow Jesus, they only mind, let me go and find somebody. You get to that person and you say, wow, listen to me, we have found the Savior. And the next thing they say to the person is, come and see and bring that person to Jesus and get that person to abide, to stay, to remain and to walk with Jesus for the rest of their lives. Go and find, come and see. And so you can see, if I can just round off this chapter, you can see that John shows us four ways of, of coming to Jesus. John and Andrew, initially the first two were saved through a preacher. John the Baptist who said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Peter in turn found Christ because of Andrew's personal work. The moment Andrew followed Jesus, he went to find his brother and said, Come and see. Brought him to Jesus. Philip was called by Christ personally, individually. He came and immediately he went to find his friend Nathaniel and said, We have found. Come and see. And so Nathaniel found Christ through the word of Jesus. And through, and through Philip's testimony. So isn't it amazing how God uses different people, 
different circumstances to bring people to his son, the Lord Jesus, a God of variety. And you can identify with that because you can tell us your testimony of how you got saved. But I think the big question tonight is, what are you doing with Jesus? If you are not saved tonight, I appeal to you, make that decision and accept Christ as Savior. Come and see. Come and see. We have found Jesus. And if you have found Jesus, why aren't you following the example of the disciples? Go and tell. Tell someone you found Jesus and bring them. Bring them bring them in. Thank you for joining us again tonight and I trust you've been blessed. Please spend some time in earnest prayer. I've given you all the prayer items, the praise items, prayer requests. Please pray, pray along that and let God lay someone on your heart that you can say from tonight to from tomorrow, I'm going to approach that person and say, I have found Jesus. Won't you come and see? Thank you again. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, tonight we thank you for your word. We know, Lord, that even though we may not be called to the office or to the may not have the gift of evangelism, it is imperative and a duty of every Christian to do the work of an evangelist. Lord, may we be burdened with our friends and those who do not know Thee as Savior. Father, if anyone is watching tonight who does not know Thee, may they come and see Jesus tonight. Lord, we remember all our praise items and our prayer requests. And again, Father... We just remember and pray for Garth tonight. May, give, may you give him a restful night, Lord, ease whatever pain he is experiencing. Please be with Elaine as she travels to the hospital and home again. Devlin and Mia and Tistella, Jade and Ronell, and the rest of our respective families. And we pray for Gregory as well, Lord, uh, anxiously waiting news on whether he needs to have an, uh, a complete cardiac bypass as well. That's a big operation. Again, Father, we just committed to Thee. Thank you so much, O Lord, for the mighty and wonderful God that you are. We pray and ask all this in your precious and wonderful name. Amen.